Hello coders, today we've got a very interesting show today. We're going to be talking about Zend, we're going to be talking about conferences, we're going to be talking about speaking, and we're going to be talking about Beachcasts. Today I'm joined by Adam Culp, who is the organizer of South Florida PHP User Group, the organizer of the Sunshine PHP Conference in South Miami. He is a PHP developer and consultant at Zend and the host of Beachcasts on Twitch and YouTube and the host of Run Geek Radio. Hi, Adam. How's it going? Hey, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> now that you read down that list, I'm like, why I'm doing, why yeah. am I doing so much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, there's a lot there to dig into. So let's, let's start with Zend. So how long have you been working at Zend as a consultant? So I'm going on my seventh year at Zend. Um, I started there, started there seven years ago. And of course, three years ago, Rogue Wave acquired us and, and I've just continued on. Mm. But, uh, but total time uh, with Zend and Rogue Wave is, is going on seven years. Wow. And what, 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 what are your roles and responsibilities? Because that you must have transitioned from many types of, of uh, things that you've been doing over that seven year period. Yeah, so I, I've been I've been a freelance for so long, and uh, then I, I came on at uh, Zend doing much the same thing, uh, doing consulting, uh, helping folks refactor applications, modernize applications, create create clean architecture from the very beginning, from the get go, um, and and so that's what I came on doing at Zend, and I just continued in that role at Rogue Wave. It's exactly the same thing. It's just a different company name. Zend is now a product line of Rogue Wave, right. um, so we still. We still operate, uh, you know, as Zend, but it's as a product line of Rogue Wave. I see. I see. So you say that you, you do a lot of refactoring of code. Does that mean that yeah. you're working mostly on legacy applications or is there new applications that you build? So it's a mix. I'd say it's probably a 70-30 split. 30% 30 is on brand new applications where a company says, Adam, you know, help us do this right from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, the other the other 70-ish percent is legacy applications where companies mm -hmm. have said, you know what, we created this application 10, 15, 20, or you know, not that long ago, 15, mm -hmm. 10 to 15 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes less, maybe, maybe five. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want to modernize it. They want to take advantage of some of the new frameworks, some of the new packages out there. They want to take advantage of the new functionalities in PHP mm. uh, and things like that. So I spend a lot of time helping them refactor these applications to be used with newer frameworks and, and, and such as that. Wow. So you, you must come across so many different sort of challenges and so many different sort of things to do with PHP and legacy code. I mean, what, what is the biggest challenge that you faced dealing with legacy? So the biggest things is is typically dealing with the legacy, uh, sometimes bootstrappers, sometimes just having require statements all over the place, right? Um, right. And and uh, modernizing that to where it can work with Composer, where Composer can then uh, be used to pull in modern libraries and yeah. modern frameworks, yeah. um, and then and then modernizing around that. Um, in some cases, it might be where they were doing PHP in the days where we used to use, uh, you know, uh, underscores between our, 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 you know, in our names, and and that delineated down to what is the directory structure, right? right. So right. that way they could auto load in that manner. Yeah. Uh, you know, PSR zero, if you're familiar with the mm. PSRs from PHP fig. Mm. Um, and, and there's a lot of applications out there that are still doing that. Mm. Um, and, and, and going to using namespaces where we don't have to do that anymore. Now we can sanely name our classes and, and, um, and use the namespacing to, to help the autoloader. Uh, that is a lot. And that's one of the biggest challenges is getting to the point where that is now able to be done. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, I'm modernizing a couple applications right now now with customers and and uh, it's i mean that's the biggest challenge is is getting over that hurdle of let's ditch the underscores and have sanely named classes and start using mm. namespaces mm. what um what kind of industries do you focus on i mean is it is it e-commerce or is it uh, sort of the entertainment industry is there any sort of particular niche that you're you you deal with not a not a particular niche. I mean, um, I mean, I've got some customers in finance, some in shipping, some in um, you know uh, working with uh, banking. Um, those are those are my big big customers that I deal with is 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 banking, finance, and and uh, and shipping things like that. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean that's really it. I don't deal much with uh, with with e-commerce. We do. I, I do get customers with e-commerce, of course. Mm. But uh, mm. and, and all of those customers that I just named, that is e-commerce in one form or another. But but it's not it's not true e-commerce. No. It's not like. No. It's not like uh, you know building a, a shopping cart or, or doing something like that these days. It's more it's more running business. Right. Uh, a lot of it is back end systems. Uh-huh. A lot of it is is managing their business, and so their internal employees can can use a web based application to help them manage the business. Right. And do you do you get sort of um, put on to teams of of just people, and you have to teach them up, train them up with the new, new style of PHP. Is that also part of your the role? Yeah, so so I do spend a fair amount of time dealing directly with the teams. Uh, a lot of training, um, you know, helping them get up. Uh, on, onboarded with some new new technologies, right? Uh, using Composer, sometimes yeah. it's sometimes it can be a little bit painful, um, you know, getting them to use Composer to pull in some of these awesome packages out there, like using Fly System, for instance, for your for your file system abstraction and okay. and Doctrine for your database abstraction, things like that, um, and and doing that through Composer. Uh, and, and that takes a bit of training because if developers haven't been working th- that way, if they've been creating their own libraries or or inside their application creating the functionality mm-hmm. and not making it um, – not making it modularized or anything like that. It's yeah. just part of the application. That's that's a learning curve. It takes a little while to get over that hump and and do that just as uh, as a habit. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I guess it's not only the, the PHP, but it's also the methodologies of how to actually do things. I mean, exactly. Do, do you do you sort of delve into deployments, continual integration, that kind of that kind of thing? So, so typically, when I work with a client, um, I'm generally presented with the client, and it's it's usually with the idea of modernizing their application. Sometimes it might be, you know, get this customer started with continuous delivery. Mm. Um, and in that case, I am I am uh, walking them through setting up a continuous delivery pipeline using Jenkins or or Bamboo or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, and and then it usually branches over into other things because usually as as you're modernizing an application, of course, you should have continuous delivery, you should set up your unit tests and things like that. Uh, there are many things, many segues to go from. So once you, once I'm working with the team, mm. I can make recommendations on all those other areas that, you know, they really should have as well, like continuous delivery unit testing. Um, if, if, if they hired me to help them with continuous delivery, it could be around, you know, hey, your, your application needs modernized. You know, you have a lot of globals here or, yeah. or something along that line. Let's fix this. So it's a lot of, a lot of code tidy up and, and, and uh, sort of bringing everything to the new world. Of, of, of the latest and greatest and stable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and a lot of it is, I mean, the, the companies are putting their trust in me to be yeah. a uh, to be an, a, an, an on-call architect. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what I am. I am an on-call architect. So okay. as they need somebody to guide them, as they need somebody to help them modernize, you know, a- implement continuous delivery, in some cases even starting to use Git, um, uh, whether it's a remote repository or a local repository, they're, I mean, they're trusting me to be their on-call architect to to guide them on the right path. Yeah, yeah. So, do you see this as kind of the it helps with the themes of your talks because it's there's there's a lot of cleanness, cleanliness that you have to do. Do you do you think that this is a good sort of foundation for the themes of the talks that you give? So that's funny you bring that up because last night I was at a user group meetup um, uh, in in, uh, in South Florida, yeah. and one of the people at the meetup I, I was talking about I was talking about uh, you know regular object oriented principles and mm-hmm. in, in domain driven design where you know entities are are a state, right? And and the the, the one person was there and, and I I was repeating things a couple of times, mm-hmm. and he spoke up and he said, "Are you training yourself right now?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I said, you know, that's exactly it. I, I do when I when I'm trying to learn something new or if I want to internalize something, mm-hmm. I very much do create a talk for it. Mm-hmm. And I usually give it at the user mm-hmm. group or I submit it to conferences and then I'm forced to give the talk if they select me to, to speak at a conference. And I do speak a lot. I, I speak at 10 to 15 events a year. Wow. So uh, so speaking that many times and each one is seems like, it's in, you know, there's a lot of crossover, a lot of them where I give the same talk uh, just in different geographic locations. But, uh, but in some cases, this completely different talks 
routes from one conference to another. Whatever the whatever the organizer feels their local um, uh, their local attendees need, mm-hmm. all right? Um, you know, based on their experience of their given area. Mm-hmm. And but yeah, I mean, all my talks are based on things that I do all the time, and and that's why I created the talk is because I said, you know what? I find that a lot of developers that I consult with they need this, so why not share it to other you know with other people at conferences? I, I guess because you can see the trends of legacy development you are able to then create a talk around that yeah exactly yeah Yeah. Yeah. and and something else i noticed too is uh you know i i'm i'm actually in the process now of revamping a lot of my talks because uh, i'm noticing that as i'm speaking at conferences there i mean there was a time when uh, when I was speaking at conferences and other people were speaking at conferences because mm. uh, I spoke with other speakers about this. And uh, what we're finding is that uh, a lot of our talks are a little bit too entry level for conferences these days right. because there was a time when PHP 5.3 came out, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, um, you know, before PHP 7, mm. uh, that developers really needed more coaching on entry level things. Mm. Uh, but what we're finding now is a lot of that, a lot of that bootstrapping at the beginning of the talk is no longer needed no. because the, because developers PHP community wide have really learned a lot. Um, you know, we've come a long way. So mm-hmm. developers, their starting point instead of starting here, now you can start them here yeah. in your talk, yeah. and 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 be able to talk a little bit more high level with them. Yeah. Um, and so so that's interesting. Now I need to go back to some of my talks though and and strip out some of that entry level stuff because uh, because the overall community just uh, it's overkill for them and they're and they're they're starting to say you know what the talk was a little bit too beginner for me yeah. uh, so I'm like okay well it's time to change I guess that gives you room for delving into more complicated ta- things though and pinning those down it- it yeah. does. It yeah. does. And and lately, I mean, some of my topics have ranged from, you know, Dr. and ORM, um, also using some more a- a advanced things and object oriented um, unit testing, uh, a lot more, a lot more precision in talking about continuous delivery. And and those things, I wasn't even able to delve into those before because mm. the vast majority of, of folks just weren't there. Right. right. They yeah. were, they, yeah. I needed to, I needed to help them break ground. Yeah. But now I can, now I can go back and talk a lot more advanced on that and also it helps me because now i need to go back and learn some more advanced things in order to talk about it <laughs> yes yes this is constant development journey yes yes yeah. i like it so how, how many how many talks have you done in total um you mean in total uh you mean the 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 topics or the or how many how, talks over the years how, how many talks over the years if, if you could put a, a so, rough number on it so so i'm thinking probably yeah, maybe maybe three four hundred. Wow. Um, you know, if you add up all the talks over a year, plus the talks that I give at the user group, and mm. uh, you know, because I'm, you know, I, I give a talk, you know, constantly at user groups. I'm giving talks and then to conferences as well, and and that also branches over into clients. Sometimes I'll be on site uh, consulting with the client, and they'll say, you know what? Can you talk about Git? So right. then I say, well, I sure can. Let me let me go ahead and I'll pull up my Git talk because I do have a, a, an essential Git for PHP developers, and I, I just pulled that out and present wow. it while I'm there. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so conferences aren't the only place that you give oh, talks. That, that's <laughs> very interesting. Very very interesting. Yeah. Um, so what what would you say is your favorite talk that you've ever given? What what was the talk that kind of you left there and thought, yeah, that's 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 the one. So in uh, a number of years ago, um, I guess it, I, you know what, I guess it was about seven years ago. About seven years ago, I was accepted to speak at OSCON in uh, Portland, Oregon. And of course, uh, you know, OSCON, it's, it's a big to do. There's, there's a lot of attendees there. It's a big crowd. And they, they asked me to deliver my Refactoring 101 talk, which was, I mean, that's my, that's my most favorite talk to give. I really love refactoring. After reading Martin Fowler's refactoring book, uh, it was changed my, how I develop and changed everything that I think about development. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I created the talk for it, and uh, it was it was odd because uh, when I uh, they they said, "Can you come speak?" and then they tell they tell you what size room they put you in, right? Well, they put me in a room with that was able to hold fifty people. Right. Uh, of right. course, OSCON is OSCON is huge. There's thousands of people who attend there. And then about a month later, I got an email. Um, well, we had to move you to a room with 80 people. Uh-huh. A we- a, a, literally a week later, we have to move you into a room that has 100 people. Wow. And it kept going up till finally 
it was like the week before the event and I'm in a room with 800 people. And, but wow. they kept incrementally making the room bigger and bigger as we got yeah. closer. So it was a hot topic at the time. Gosh. And, and it was probably the best I've delivered that talk in my lifetime, yeah. even though I've given that talk probably 80, 90 times. Mm. Uh, the best time I ever gave it was at that OSCON because I was pumped. I was like, yeah. the, the room kept getting bigger. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, people are really excited about this. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. So, I mean... How many sort of attendees do you think? I'm mean, going back to the the the, the uh, Sun Sunshine PHP. How many attendees yeah. do you think uh, would be there? So Sunshine PHP, we sell out at 350. Um, I keep Sunshine PHP that size because I really like the venue that we hold it at. Mm -hmm. They've been great with me. The venue is one one mile away from the Miami airport, so it's nice and easy. There's a shuttle there. People can fly into the airport. They hop on the shuttle, and in minutes, they're at the hotel. So it's really easy to do. Um, so I like holding the conference there. And that uh, that venue, unless they, unless they add on to the hotel, we can only handle 350 people so that is the sellout point and sunshine php has sold out the last five years wow I'm so, so uh, happy yeah. I'm going. I'm so happy I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and and this year, this year should also be comparable in size. I mean, everything's mm. really going well. We're we're mm. getting everything. I mean, they even changed. We changed the way that we we, we lay out the room. Uh, the first couple years for Sunshine PHP, we laid out the room length longwise, right? right? So we had rows of chairs from one end to the other longwise, and. And then like the third year, I said, you know what, that's a little bit crowded and it's really difficult for people to get in and out of that room. Um, so what if we turned it sideways <laughs> and made the room wider instead of longer? So we did that and, and it worked out awesome. It made for a larger stage. Then we put two screens in the front too, so people could see it on either end of the room. Yep. And uh, and it's worked out really well. We still fill the room. It's, uh, it's still, you know... You have to make sure you get to the keynotes fast because you will you will not have a seat right. if you right. get there too late uh, because it's it's kind of hard because it is capacity seating. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of extra chairs in there. Mm -hmm. There's enough <laughs> chairs for everybody, but there's not extra chairs. So sometimes seeing the empty chair in a in a fully uh, fully filled room is yeah. hard to see the empty chairs and people end up standing in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so what kind of topics? will I be hoping to see when I'm there this, uh, this, this year? You know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I did something a little different this year. So in previous years, we always picked the hottest topics and Sunshine is known for, for having a really good lineup. Mm. I mean, we, we have 30 speakers plus, you know, plus the five keynote speakers, which is, is 35 you know, speakers for the entire event. That's that's large. That's, that's very lot. big for an event yeah. to have 35 speakers because not only are we paying for the airfare, but in a hotel for all of them, but it's just a lot of speakers. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Uh, many conferences, they will have speakers give two talks per speaker. Hmm. I don't do that with Sunshine. I have one talk per speaker. And the reason is, is because I want that speaker to, to do their best job on that talk. And I also want to make it... Um, you know, it also means that there's more community at mm -hmm. the conference, right? Mm -hmm. Because instantly you've already got 35 mm -hmm. community people right there mm -hmm. in a conference uh, that people want to see, right? Mm -hmm. These are the these are the bloggers and the speakers and the contributors to different packages, yeah. and so people want to see them. They yeah. want to be able to talk and and hear them speak. So. Uh, what I've done this year is a little bit different because in previous years, uh, we included frameworks as part of the talks, right? Okay. So uh, intro to Laravel, intro to Zend, uh, mm -hmm. intro to Symfony, what have you. Mm -hmm. This year, I didn't do that. This year, this year, we said, you know what? No framework talks. Right. Now, that's not because we're anti-framework, because I'm not. I'm like, everybody should be using a framework for their development. Mm -hmm. But I decided, you know what? Laravel has a really awesome event, uh, you know, every year, one in the U.S., one in one in uh, Europe, and now they're even branching out further. Zend has their own with ZenCon. Um, you know, Symfony has Symfony Lives. So all these leading frameworks, they have their own conferences mm -hmm. for people to attend and learn. Mm -hmm. I don't need to teach them frameworks anymore. No. You know, obviously frameworks are, are wide enough used. I don't need to focus on that anymore. But PHP has changed so much over, over you know, the last 
you know, five to eight years that we really need to educate developers. We really need to educate ourselves on these changes in PHP. Mm. There are so many great packages out there that we need to learn these packages. So what I did with my talks, and if you look on the schedule, there are no framework talks. Mm. It is all PHP mm. talks. It is, it is um, you know, talks around doing professional development in PHP. Um, and now if a speaker happens to use a framework as part of their code examples, that's a different matter. That may be there, but uh, but it's not going to be any framework specific talks. And again, it's not because we're anti-framework. That is not the case. It's just because I feel that that's not what the community really needs down here in, in, in South Florida and, and and maybe even in many other places in the world. Yes, but, uh, definitely. I yeah. definitely agree with that. It's actually something mm -hmm. that drove me to it because when I went down the list of, of the talks, um, that actually popped out to me as, as it's actually talking about good practices in PHP rather than this is the hot new trend. And yeah. that, that, yeah, that pushed me in that direction. Um, oh, well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you noticed it. Yeah. We that, hadn't talked about it before. No, so. no, it was, um, so I, w what I did is I, I went through a lot of, because uh, I wanted to do one international conference. I wanted to go to one place uh, this year. And I had a couple sort of that I was looking at and I was comparing the talks. And uh, that was something that really sort of stood out to me. Uh, because the other the other ones, it's kind of like um, a pickle mix of themes. Yeah. So I like the way that that was, that was addressed. So, yeah. so how, many, how many papers do you get on average? to one of these conferences. So I'm, I'm going to venture to guess and say that Sunshine PHP gets more than anybody. <laughs> and and the reason I say that is because I also I also uh, help with the call for papers for ZenCon, right. which is which is the you know the the largest PHP conference, um, PHP specific conference, mm. uh, and and Sunshine PHP also being you know uh, now the largest uh, PHP conference. Mm. Um, you know, so we average about six to seven hundred submissions. Wow. Um, now, I mean, I have spoke with other organizers of other PHP events, mm -hmm. and they they talk about having 200, 250, 300 submissions. So I think we probably get the most. Um, but but that being said, I mean, it's it's Miami. Come on, it's Miami in February. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was also a selling point as well, I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, everybody else is going to be cold and snowy and frozen, and, and we're going to be in Miami partying in 70 degrees. Especially here in <laughs> the enough. UK, yeah, where yeah. it's uh, windy and cold, and uh, we've yes. had to knock up the heating. Um, wow. So, I mean, how do you go about sort of whittling that down and finding the talks that you want to use? Do you, do you start with a theme? and then look for the papers that match that theme, or do you wrap the theme around the talks that come out and, and sort of shout out to you? It's, it's inter interesting that you bring that up. We do have a theme. Every year I have a theme for Sunshine PHP. This year it is lead. I right. like my single word themes um, <laughs> because I like keeping it simple. So this year it's about leading. Last year it was communication and, uh, and or communicate. Right. And in previous years we have have uh, other iterations. This year it's lead. lead. So you'll yeah. find that our keynotes are centered around lead because I do pick the keynotes with the central theme in mind. Mm. However, the talks are not that. I do not pay attention to the theme when it comes to choosing talks. Right. Uh, for the talks, it's very much what is the community hot about? Uh, what am I finding that uh, that people need as I'm doing consulting? Um, and that is pretty much how we choose the talks. Now, the, the talks are iterative, right? Because with that many talks, you can't possibly just pick out 30 out of 700, right? Mm -hmm. It just it's mm. not that not that easy. So what we do is me and a few other people that I've that I've asked to be on our committee for choosing talks. Uh, we we of course Open CFP is the application that we use for uh, people to submit talks. After that, I export the data from there into another application which I call TalkRate. Um, it was created by one of our user group members uh, okay. down here in South Florida. He was gracious enough to create it and uh, years ago, and we've just kept continued using it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is out on, uh, if you go to GitHub at Sunshine PHP, you'll find it there. It is open source. It's freely available for anybody who wants to use it. Um, but that being said, so I export the talks into there from OpenCFP. Mm. And then uh, that allows us then to go in and rate the talks one to five stars. 
So we go through all 700 of them. We look at every single talk. We look at every single speaker and we rate them one to five stars. Uh, Now that doesn't mean that anybody who's a one star is necessarily bad. It just means that it didn't strike us as something that was really hot right now. Maybe the speaker isn't very experienced at Sunshine PHP. We Mm. do require the speakers to be experienced. I, 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 I know there's a lot of contention. People say a lot of different things about that. My take is if people are paying two and three hundred dollars to sit in a seat and see the best talks, I'm going to give them the best talks, and that means that I'm going to give them experienced speakers who are able to to do a good job. I know they're able to give them a good job, mm-hmm. do a good job. It doesn't mean that somebody new can't speak. Not at all. It just means that I know these people have given talks and that they're going to do a good job. I don't, I'm not gambling. I don't mm. gamble because uh, if people are paying money for that. Mm. Now we do have an uncon. If you want to, if you want to come and attend Sunshine PHP and give a talk in any way, you can do that in the uncon. And the uncon is very well uh, received at Sunshine. We end up with ten to twenty people mm. uh, in the uncon per talk slot, and and they do they do actually go to the uncon talks. Um, But after we've done that, after we've rated them one to five stars, then we make another sweep through. I pretty much, uh, from there, I export the four into five stars. Mm Mm-hmm. And I go through and I and and pretty much just make sure that we have a good round lineup. I would, I, you know, all the talks can't be PHP unit. All the talks can't be security. All the talks can't be continuous delivery. Yeah. Um, you know, so I go through and I make sure we have a good round schedule out of that. Uh, I usually end up down to about now the four and five stars. That is uh, almost 200 talks, right? Mm. So we're still at 200 yeah. talks that are four and five stars. Yeah. And we still got to get down to 30. <laughs> so so we do iteratively, we keep on chipping away until we get down to the point where we where we have 30 talks. Wow. And, um, and sometimes I do have to go back and dip in the one, two, and three stars. I can't mm. just get them all out of the four and five stars to make sure that I have a good round schedule. That must take so much time to, 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 to do and prepare. I mean, we haven't it even got, got to the point of actually just organizing sponsors and the venue. This is just talking about the talks. I mean, how, how long does that process usually take? So it's actually quite fast. Right. Um, so be, because me and the other folks that I've asked to contribute uh, in this way, uh, we've gotten pretty good at it. <laughs> so, uh, so that it could take up to two weeks. Mm-hmm. So, so it's two weeks, not solid work. I mean, it's an hour here, an hour there. Uh, it takes about two weeks to get down to what talks are we going to, what, do we want to reach out to the speakers and accept? Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, but it is, it is, uh, it is arduous. It's uh, because you're, we're, we're reading the abstract for 700 talks and we're reading the speaker bios for 700 <laughs> talks. We're doing, we're doing YouTube searches and joined in searches to see if they've spoken in the past. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at user groups sometimes i'm reaching directly out to the speakers and saying hey by the way i don't see that you put experience in here but your talk topic was was uh something that i think is is attractive do you have any speaking experience and sometimes they say no and then i you know we do reject them yeah uh but sometimes they say yes i'm sorry i didn't put it in there and then they send us uh they send us you know sometimes youtube videos sometimes uh you know where the conference has taken a video of them Mm. speaking in the past and it's worked out Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from because I mean you, you're you're obviously a speaker yourself, mm-hmm. and you've been a speaker for several years. What um what would you say makes a good s- a public speaking thing? What 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 is it that makes a talk a good talk? There is there is one thing, and I mean there are many things that make it good, right? right. But there is one thing that I look for above all else, right? And that's passion, right? If you, if you're not passionate about the topic, if mm. you can't sit, and if your voice doesn't squeak a little bit talking about <laughs> refactoring, and you're giving a refactoring talk, then I'm not going to choose you, right? You know, yeah. you have to be passionate about it because the the attendees are paying for somebody who's passionate, and then once the passion's there, once you know that the passion's there for the yeah. topic, then it's a matter of now we need to look at the content, right? Yes. Is the content good? Um, 
in many cases, I've I've uh, spoke with uh, spoke with speakers, and I'm like, you know what, your passion's there. I can see it's there, and I can see the the everything's there. But can I work with you to tweak your talk to make it better? Mm-hmm. And I've actually mentored many speakers. Um, you yeah. know, some of them uh, that may be listening to this or out there nodding their head. Yeah, he did. <laughs> you know, he told us we were terrible and we had to fix it. Um, and, and of course, it wasn't that bad. But um, but I've I've mentored many speakers, and and not because I'm so great at speaking not that at all. I just, you know, I, I use the analogy, you know, when you listen to music on, on your, in your MP3 player, you listen to music and you're streaming it or something like that, or listening mm. in a radio in your car, mm. you can tell when a bad song comes up, right? Yeah. And you can tell when a good song comes up, you start mm. tapping your foot and it sounds really good to you. Well, talks are much the same way. I can, I can kind of tap my foot along with the talk, so to speak, Right. And because because it's it's really melding with me and the, yeah. and the content is really good, but maybe the delivery could be better. So I do mentor where I'm able to. So it has a kind of like a rhythm to it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. Like you, you know, like we might not be able to give the best talk, but we can tell when one's bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I've I've done uh, a couple of user groups. I think I've spoken to about three or four. Um, I haven't done a, a fully fledged conference talk and I personally find that the nerves of talking to a group of people get the better of me in the first sort of sort of third into the talk do you still get nerves and how do you deal with them if you do i i do i still get nerves you know it's funny because lately i've been doing this uh, beach cast and uh, even recording that because i'm doing it as a live stream i am so nervous the day that i'm getting ready to do it and, uh, i mean it's it's like uh, you know okay i gotta stop drinking coffee i need to just i need to just calm down and at conferences it's much the same thing um as i'm getting ready to get on stage the first three four minutes so what I found, what I found helps me is I, I always get those jitters right at the beginning, and I start talking faster and faster and faster. Uh, yes. And, and in about yes. three, four minutes in, I'm like, wait a minute, I feel myself starting to sweat. Mm. I, I feel I'm starting to trip over my words, so I'll just stop and take a deep breath, mm. and then. I'll just start talking again. And and from then on, the talk is amazing. I'm able to relax. I'm not stressed out anymore. I, I don't talk too fast anymore. But it's taken a while for me to learn that little trick. It's mm. just like, you know, you're going to ramble right at the beginning. Right. You're going to be excited right at the beginning. Yeah. So about, about three minutes in, just pause and take a breath. Um, what kind of brought me to that realization is one time I was giving a talk and and I was, I was really starting to stumble. I was getting caught up in the slides. I was getting caught up in the code. I was starting to trip over my words. And, um, and, and at that point, I just I stopped. And, and everybody was, looked at me. I said, bear with me just a minute. I got to catch my breath because I feel like I'm running a mile here. <laughs> and uh, so I took a breath. And then, and, but that did it. Mm. Uh, immediately, the stress was gone from my neck and my back. Um, and, and I gave a really good talk. Um, and, and so from and now that's just become a standard thing that I do is uh, it was about three minutes. And I've actually got the timer that er, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a clicker that I use. And that clicker has a timer in it. Right. I actually have a timer set for four minutes in, so it vibrates in my hand, and I and it reminds me stop and breathe. That's brilliant. And then and then from then on, it's smooth sailing. I, I guess that's because you are regaining control over the situation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You're not allowing yeah. the situation to run away with itself. Yeah. Well, I think I think we as speakers we tend to. We, we, we want to please. That's why we're speaking is we yes. want to help people. We want to please. Yes. And so I, I, I get into the habit of, you know what, I need to talk faster. I need to get all the content out there and I need to tell them everything now before they can ask me a question. I need to sure. get that information sure. out there and preempt their question. Yes. Um, and this, but what I found is when I just relax, yeah. uh, because th- if they ask the question, you're going to ask it anyway. Right. Yes. Um, but I can get the content yes. out there a lot better if I just take a breath and calm down. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So I guess it's completely different from the the YouTube stuff that you've been doing because you know let's let's talk about the beach car stuff. This is this is really exciting stuff. This is a channel that you've you've recently uh, created. Um, wh- why? What drew you to that? What was the the thing that? Uh, pr- so the interesting thing is, as a consultant. Um, 
as a consultant, I don't get to develop anymore. I don't, I'm not writing code. I'm right. not doing all these awesome things that I really enjoy doing as a yeah. developer. Um, and because of that, I'm not learning anymore, or at least not learning at the pace that I would, uh, that I am accustomed to. Right. I, I really enjoy the thing that I learn about developing is there is always a new problem to solve. Mm-hmm. There's always something new to learn. There's always some new technology to help you do things better. Mm-hmm. And I was getting into a situation where customers were asking me, hey, have you tried this? And have you tried this? And I'm saying, no, I haven't tried that. <laughs> no, I haven't heard of that. Um, and so I was, it was really, uh, I, I could see where it was really going to hurt me consulting wise if I didn't catch back up. Mm. Right. Mm. So, so I started doing that. And and as I was doing that, I was I was going through some documentation. I was I was working most recently. I've been working a lot with Doctor and ORM. Mm-hmm. I haven't used Doctor and ORM a lot, mm-hmm. um, uh, it, but I've been telling people they should use it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, let me learn that. Let me pick up on on DDD because I haven't been doing domain driven design a lot. So mm-hmm. let me let me start reading the books and learning that and using Doctrine. Well, as I was using it, I was finding it, I was going to the website. The Do- Doctrine has a, a awesome documentation. Their mm-hmm. their website is really good. Their contributors who who contributed the documentation did a really good job. However, there are missing pieces. Mm-hmm. As with as with yeah, most things, with there's always yeah. more than one way to do something. Yeah, I, I was doing some searching for these things. I was trying to build associations, right? Right. I, I wanted to I wanted to have associations. So if I wanted to query a bank, it would give me all the branches. It would give me all the people that were assigned to the branch to the bank and everything else. Um, and I wanted to get that. I wanted to do one query and give me all that information in one query and let me disseminate it to mm-hmm. a view or or as an API or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. now there are times when you don't want all that information. I just want the bank. Don't give me all the branches and all that crap. I don't need all the data. And that's that's well and good. Mm-hmm. But in my case, I wanted to get all that information so I didn't have to iterate over the bank and do multiple queries, uh, multiple calls to the server because it just slows down. It's just not a good way to do it. No. So so with Dr. and ORM, I wanted to do that. I wanted to build these associations. Well, looking at the documentation, I wasn't finding what I exactly needed. Right. Um, you know, I, 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 in the documentation, in some cases, they were saying, oh, well, you build this relationship, you can do it through your annotations, and then you have to, you know, you use the annotation driver, and you're able to pull all that out, and it builds all this for you. But in some places in the documentation, they didn't allude to the fact that I also needed to make sure I had a collection being created in the constructor in order to pull in these extra things, right? Yes, yes. I was searching everywhere for it. I was yeah. searching, I was on Stack Overflow, I was on websites, I was out on uh, uh, SymphonyCast, they have some yeah. awesome videos on Doctrine, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't finding what I needed because everybody was doing it a different way. Yes. And and but yes. but I couldn't take I couldn't take an example from one place and use it with an example from another place which actually is what I needed but mm. I how do I join these together nobody's doing them. Yeah. So I said okay. I, 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 what if I created videos and put this information out there and created some podcasts? And what if I updated the, uh, you know, my, I could do blog posts. What if I updated the documentation to also include this? And of course, everybody's like, yeah, 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 you do all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's kind of how it started. I said, you know what? Okay. So I'm, I'm creating this sample application because I want to u- learn more about Zend Expressive. Mm-hmm. I want to learn more about middleware. I want to be able to create microservices. I want to be able to create an API first type approach doing this and I want to use Dr. and ORM yes um, and I'll, and I want to use uh, you know uh, Ben Ramsey's UUID uh, because what if somebody wants to have their application over multiple servers right mm. then so you have to you know multiple servers you, you know and if they're creating uh, records from multiple servers you can't use a auto increment <laughs> anymore it just doesn't work well so you use UUIDs um, so anyway I, I wanted to use all these things, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to create a series of videos, and and that's how Beachcast was born. It's Brilliant. going to be a series of videos creating the sample application, so I'm able to learn. I'm also uh, – other people are able to look over my shoulder, so to speak, so they can see and learn themselves through the process. That's really, really awesome. And. The, these are live streamed to Twitch, are they not? And then they're, yeah. and then they're put onto YouTube. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I decided, you know, if, if, if creating videos was hard, how could I make it harder? <laughs> Let me live stream it. Um, no, I, I, so a friend of mine, uh, uh, Christopher Pitt in Australia and Bo Simonson with Astrocast, um, mm-hmm. they, they do a lot of streaming to Twitch, um, mm-hmm. and some great content, uh, great content, good stuff. And of course, gamers all over the world are using Twitch. Yes. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, let me, I, I, my original intent was let me go ahead and do this experimenting. Let me do this development live on Twitch, mm. mistakes, uh, Google searches, and the whole thing, right? Mm. Um, so, so as I started getting ready to do that, uh, I recorded the first episode and I'm like, okay, that went pretty well. It wasn't too bad. Um, I did do a little bit more preparation, so it wasn't too raw, mm. uh, but it was raw. Mm. Uh, I did, I did stumble. I did make some mistakes. I, you know, I forgot to, to put something in the code and it didn't work the way I thought it was going to. But anyway, so yeah, I started doing it on Twitch and then I thought, uh, well, on Twitch, you can then trim the video, the beginning and the front, so yeah. that only the usable content is what you want. So you don't end up with a countdown on the beginning for eight minutes, right? You can you can strip that off. Yes. Um, and then once I have that, once I have you know the the trimmed uh, uh, video down, then I can push that to YouTube. Yes. And on YouTube, on YouTube, although you can't really do a lot of video editing, but you can take out some of the little pauses mm. and and things such as that. Uh, and and then I also started creating thumbnails to put on to the beginning. So as people were searching for it, they see the video. They don't see me. Uh, you know, yes. They, instead, they actually yeah. see something really yeah. nice, and it's got some text on it. So just looking at the thumbnail, they can tell it's content that they want to see. <laughs> and so I've just been tweaking it over time, and to yeah. get it to where it is now, we're on our. It's on my fifth recording. Yeah. Uh, I think four yeah. recordings actually are. Um, are building the project. One recording I did just as an intro to say, hi, I'm Adam and I'm going to do this thing and, and come check us out. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so now all the episodes are still out on Twitch. So mm. if anybody mm. happens to find me on Twitch, it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, and But then on, on it's also on YouTube for the people who find things through Google search and well, through I'll, YouTube. I'll definitely um, put the links in the show notes and, and all oh, that. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It's, there's always yeah. this, this weird situation when you press the start streaming button and you're not too sure whether you're live or not. Yeah. So you'll kind of look, you got this really weird look on your face as to <laughs> am I live or not? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and so I did that. Uh, that was my first iterations, right? And as I'm going through that, then I'm looking at it, even on YouTube, it had this, uh, this uh, very un, unsure beginning. Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad I could trim that. Uh, so I did trim that off and, and somebody in my, in my second, uh, my second recording, Mm. Um, a friend of mine reached out and he said, you know what, you should have get some sort of little intro to, to the beginning of that. Um, and so I started doing some researching. I started looking at other YouTubers. And I was like, what did you do? What did you do? And a lot of them went out to Fiverr, uh, F-I-V-V-R, mm-hmm. I think is the name. Mm-hmm. And f- so for $7, I got an intro. Excellent. And, uh, it's and, very and, slick, and, by the way. I've seen it. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you. And by coincidence, the person who uh, created it, he had like, um, he had like seven or eight intros and, and he was like, $7, you know, uh, I'll build the intro. Well, then uh, he had, a, he had an intro or an introduction video of himself. Right. And one of the, w- there was an intro there that kind of showed water kind of splashing over top of the logo. And I was like, can that one be included? And the next day he sent it to me. He's like, yeah, here, Excellent. it's done. And that's the intro that I'm using Excellent. because, uh, you know, Beachcast, it just makes sense to yes. kind of have water washing over the text. Uh, of course, it's actually an ink stain washing over the text. But it, to me, it's a beach yeah, because yeah. it's Beachcast, beach right? Cast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. no, it, it worked out really well. And uh, he actually shortened it. I asked him, I said, uh, well, that's, it was 12 seconds. I'd like to get it down to nine seconds. And there's too many transitions. Can you cut out a couple of those? And yeah. and he was graciously, you know, he, he removed two of the transitions. It mm-hmm. made it shorter to where I wanted it. And uh, so there you go. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, um, what is the schedule of this show? What is the uh, what, how many do you push out a week or month or 
whatever. So I'm, I'm aiming for one a week. One a week. Um, right. So I'm recording Wednesdays. So if somebody were inclined and want to be on Twitch live and see me doing it live, it would be Wednesdays at, uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Eastern time. Yeah. Uh, that's when I'm, that's when I'm recording is 4 p.m. Eastern time. And then usually it takes me about an hour to get everything out to YouTube. Uh, so then, you know, roughly, well, so it's about a 25 to 30 minute recording mm -hmm. and then another hour to get it out to YouTube. So by mm -hmm. 6 p.m. it's on YouTube. Um, and um, so that's the plan. That's that's the way it's been going and working so far is I'm recording at 4 p.m. Done around 4.30 p.m. And then about uh, 5.30 p.m. I'm, I'm pushing it out to YouTube and, and get it going there. That's a, that's, that's a good sort of uh, schedule to have. And uh, if, yep. you can, if you can keep that, that would be awesome. That would be, be very well, I've good. Well, I've, I've got reminders in my calendar yeah. and everything else. Uh, so it reminds me the day before and it reminds me the morning of uh, <laughs> because I, I do much better on a schedule. If I'm not on a schedule, chances are I'm not going to get it done. Uh, so I, I did that. And then I started putting myself on a schedule as well with the podcast, uh, Run Geek Radio. Radio, yes. uh, because I, I found that if I don't put myself on a schedule for that, I'm not going to do it either. <laughs> uh, so the idea, of course, for Run Geek Radio is I want to I want to do at least one episode a month, right. um, maybe more, but uh, but one a month is 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 what I'm aiming for. And where do you see Beachcasts and Run Geek Audio? Where do you radio? Do you, where do you see the the themes sort of interlinking or? I mean, is there is there a distinct difference between the two in terms of the content that you wish to push out? There is. Uh, so, so my idea behind Run Geek Radio, of course, is I talk for a few minutes about running because I do a lot of running. I'm an ultra runner, so I mm. do a fair amount of running. So I talk about something related to running, whether it's you know changing my shoes or or some run that I might be running in, like in November I ran in the New York Marathon, things like that. Mm. And I talk about something running, just small, right? And, and, and then the rest of the time, I mean, it's usually, it's usually a 15 to 20 minute podcast. Uh, so, so usually it's three, maybe four minutes dedicated to something running related. And then the rest of it, I'm talking about uh, tech related stuff, or mm -hmm. it's more soft skills. Right. It's more about, it's more about uh, working together in teams, uh, teaching, mentoring, uh, contributing to the community, uh, maybe some other things that I see, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, it's not so much technical. Mm -hmm. Um, although I might talk, I, I, you know, at times I might talk about some package in, in, uh, some rough usage of it. It's not really meant to be technical. Mm -hmm. So my idea is Beachcast is going to be code. It's going to be code. It's going to be in the mix. It's going to be doing programming, learning some new technology. Like one of the videos in the past was creating Docker containers using Docker compose. And what does the Docker compose look like? And what does the, what does the Docker file look like mm -hmm. to create the, the images and everything else? Mm -hmm. Um, and then another video I did on, on Beachcast was using PHP Storm and how do I set up my environment? How do I connect it to MySQL? How do I connect it to Docker? How do I connect it to PHP unit? Mm -hmm. Whereas with uh, Run Geek Radio, it is more along the lines of, okay, how do I work together as a team? How do I not step on other people? How do I not allow other people to step on me? Um, you know, it's so it's a lot more soft skills, which is infinitely as important as development itself. Uh, but I think it's something that a lot of people don't focus on. Definitely. So yeah. my my favorite closing statement of, of Run Geek Radio is be good to yourself and others, because that is what it's all about. If you're if you're not able to live up to that, you're not going to be happy developing no matter how many problems you're solving and no matter how much you know. Yeah, that's a that's a good thing to end on with, uh, yeah. with that statement. Yeah. So you're working on uh, doctrine and you mentioned PHP Storm. Is is there? What's your schedule looking like in the next, in the next few uh, few episodes on Beach Camp? Yeah, so, so now we've we've created the project. We've got uh, we've got Zend Expressive installed. We've got uh, we've got doc, a Docker all set up. So now we've got a Docker container for the MySQL database and a separate Docker container for mm. our instance of PHP and Apache. Mm. Um, and we're using we're using the images, the official images from MySQL and the official images from uh, from the PHP uh, to to do that. Um, and then we came back and we set up uh, PHP Storm. 
Um, then we created modules in Zend Expressive because I like making applications modular. I like mm-hmm. being able to separate the logic out in different modules. And then the latest episode was installing Doctrine. So now we've got Doctrine installed. We've got the configurations created. We've got it working command line. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we could use the command line tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's often the thing that people have difficulties with is, you know, you can get, sure, you can uh, you can use Composer and install Dr. and ORM, but then fire up a, a CLI and see if you can get it rendering and usually it, it fails. Um, so so I think that'll be really helpful. I, I, hope, I hope a lot of people are able to use that and get their CLI up and running because it, it is helpful to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, not to mention the CLI for Zend Expressive for mm-hmm. creating modules and creating middlewares and all that. You can do all that in CLI as well. That was uh, we we got that up and running. So, so one of my next episodes, or actually the next episode, is going to be now that we've got Doctrine up and running, mm-hmm. we're going to connect it up to the database and we're going to create an entity. And through that entity, then we're going to, um, in the module that we've already created, we're going to start start querying the database and be able to output the results. Uh, we're building an API. So the sample right. application okay. is an API. So okay. the output is not view. It is not HTML. It is JSON. Okay. And yeah. So, uh, so the idea is that the, in the next one, then we'll be able to, you know, query the database for all the results of a given table, um, output that as JSON, uh, and then we can create pagination as well with it. So, um, I don't know how much I'm going to get done in the next episode. I think creating the entity, there's no relationships in the entity that I'm going to be creating this time. So, I'm thinking I could probably put t- pagination in there. So, I'll probably create an entity. And and create the read or the crud. I could create most of the crud. I think. Yeah. Uh, I'll yeah. probably create some of that crud ahead of time, mm-hmm. but then uh, kind of cover it in the video and say, okay, here's what I did and here's how I constructed that. Um, so I think I'll probably create the crud ahead of time just to keep the videos uh, mm-hmm. flowing, and then uh, and then yeah. So and and then in the future ones, of course, then we'll create additional modules and we'll start using some associations. Excellent. You know, so, Excellent. Uh, and, and so each each video will have, my, my goal is to make each video about 20 to 25 minutes. Right. Uh, okay. so, so I'll do what can be done in 20 to 25 minutes to help you move forward with the project. Mm-hmm. And I, I, funny enough, I, I say funny, but, uh, but I'm, actually, I'm actually very honored by this. I've actually had a couple people who have been watching the videos who actually emailed me and said, by the way, I was following a lot in your example, and I'm getting this error. Right. So they're so they're actually doing yeah. the application with me through the videos, which is amazing. Yes, it's uh, that that part of the community, the driven aspect of that is 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 just so mind blowing. I find, and you're doing this live, which is well into the deep end. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, the the best thing about going live though, is that you do show all of the mistakes, warts and all, because you have to, you can't edit yes. that, that out. And right. there are some, some things that I've done. I've worked for different publication companies where it has to be as clean as possible, like a clean right. as a whistle. So, and, and there's a, there is a big demand to show mistakes because you are showing how you solve those mistakes. Do, you, do yeah. how, how do you go about doing that? Do you do you because you obviously have to keep the audience engaged as you're yes. trying to solve the problem. Do you have any tips on on how to do that from my perspective? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so for um, the key to the key to recovery is. Mm communication yeah. right um your people are not going to be bored if you're talking your way through it mm. um I've, I've recently been watching some videos uh because i because it's a, a, an interest to me watching videos uh more and more companies are starting to do interactive interviewing right right, right. Yeah. where they're interviewing candidates and through the process of the interview they're having them solve problems yeah. and solve coding problems yeah and, and now they're not looking to see, did you successfully solve the problem? I mean, all that, that, that's a part of it, but that's not the big key of it. The key of it is, is they want to see, okay, can you communicate while you're doing this? Mm-hmm. Can, you talk, can you talk your way through a problem? Can you talk your way uh, through the debugging process? Um, and can you talk afterwards and, and come to a conclusion of how to make something better, yeah. right? Uh, so that's really interesting to me, I, and it's and this is a challenge, yeah. uh, but but it's something that I incorporated into these videos. Mm-hmm. Is as I'm going through, um, there's a there's a couple sites out there. Uh, uh, 
Interview Cake and Brilliant are are two different sites mm. that, that they have problems on a regular basis that you can practice and, right. and do these things. And I've been playing with them only because they're fun. Yes. It's it's really practicing data structures, practicing algorithms and things like these. And yes. I even have a whiteboard here set up in the side of my office and I whiteboard it. I don't I don't do the coding in Notepad. I don't do the coding in PHP Storm. I do the coding on the whiteboard as I'm solving these <laughs> problems. And and now that, that's a bit of that that that's a bit of torture, but but at the same time I've learned a lot through it. Yeah. Because yeah. because doing it that way it's not I don't have I'm not worried about the tabs I'm not worried about the spaces I'm not worried about the curly braces on the right line I'm worried about can can I can my mind think through doing that. Mm. Um, mm. And I have another story I'll share in just a moment. But but anyway, so uh, so I find that when I'm when I'm doing the videos and I'm I run into a, a blocker, I kind of talk as I'm going. Oh, what mm. went wrong there? Well, let me look at the error. Oh, okay. And in one of the videos, I did. It was an error, mm. and uh, it ended up being because I w- I practiced ahead of time and I left a line of code in there. <laughs> um, I left a use statement, or I, actually I. I removed the use statement to pull in a, a third-party library, but I had this—I had the code in there that was still trying to use it, yeah. and uh, but I, so I found it pretty quickly. Yeah. But uh, but I talked through that. I talked through it as I did it, and I found it really quick uh, through the talking. But mm. that takes practice. It does. It does. It, it does. Yeah. Definitely. Um, it, I remember when I first did some live <laughs> streams, live coding streams, and I would. Uh, it would take a long time before actually pressing the start button because yeah. I was running through so many things in my head, making sure everything was uh, was in place, not only the streaming software, but but also making sure the IDEs were in the right place, the windows were yeah. viewing. And in some cases, I even did the whole thing offline before right. I actually went live. And normally it didn't even go the way I wanted it to go or you go into a di- completely different direction. Um, yeah. I did a, I did a series um, a, a few years back called coffee and code with where the intention was to have a coffee and write some code. And yet the, the actual episode turned into a good few hours worth of oh, footage yeah. because, because you end up just falling down a rabbit hole. When do you, when do you go, right, this is, this is the cutoff point. This is where I'm going to stop today. Do you have a, do you give yourself a time limit? Is there a, is there anything like that? So I've, I've, uh, so far I've been able to look at it and pretty much guesstimate, okay, this is about 20, 25 minutes in, mm. um, as long as I don't run into any problems. And, and I've been able to guesstimate. I don't, right. I haven't gotten far enough yet to really know or to, to really go down any rabbit hole. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, now, now that being said, with this application, I am kind of doing it ahead of time, so it's mm. not it's not true, it's not true blind investigation in this case. Uh, in the future, it might be mm. uh, for some other projects and things. Uh, Bo Simonson does that. I mean, he's uh, when when he does Astrocast, he is truly going down rabbit holes on the video and and solving these problems, and. Um, and it's kind of refreshing to see him do it. So, so his recordings are an hour, but mm-hmm. he's got maybe fifteen minutes, maybe twenty minutes of content, yes. right? And and that's because he's going down a rabbit hole. He's thinking through logically how will this work, and and there's there's definitely benefit to that. But mm-hmm. it is it is a longer recording. It's not like uh, you know. I, I can't, uh, it would be difficult for somebody to search for a way of doing something and then, uh, well, here's a one hour episode, uh, some three minute snippet in there is how to do it. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I think it is a great learning tool. I've, I've really enjoyed the, the episodes that I've been present at because I'll, I'll log in on Twitch and watch and, 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 and type to him, uh, type messages to him while he's doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, there is value to it. I enjoy yeah. it. It is pair programming, uh, at, it, at it its, uh, at its root. And it's yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Um, Definitely. now that being said, uh, I'm not a fast programmer by any means. I, I mean, that being said, when I get into a groove, um, I can, I can program quite a bit in a day, mm-hmm. but I'm not a fast programmer. When I'm program, when I'm pair programming with other people, they're running circles around me, and they're like, "Okay, Adam, just get out of my way. Let me do it." <laughs> and I'm like, "Please, you know, just go ahead, type." <laughs> and uh, you know, the keyboard's yours. Uh, but that being said, I find that talking out loud uh, and practicing that helps me. 
uh, because it uh, it does it does help me to be able to do things a little bit faster when it does come time to to do uh, your real pair programming, which I enjoy doing. Hey, that's a really good point because I'm a remote developer and I find myself just talking to the yep. wall, to the cat, to to anything that will listen <laughs> yep. about the situation yep. that I'm in, and I find that going through the code in my head and speaking it out loud is actually really, really useful, really helpful. And yep. it's almost like you're, you're not having a discussion with yourself, but you are just listing the things that you want to achieve and how to get there in terms of the code. Yep. You've gone through- You're rubber ducking. Yes, yes. You've gone yeah. through this, this line of code. You're, in, you're now in this loop. At this point, this happens. You're calling that method. Yes. So you're kind of breaking it down into a nice linear- sort of thing yep. but uh, and, and I find that it helps the person you're pair programming with when you are with somebody yes. because through through your rambling through your talking as long as you're doing it um, you know they might pick up on something yes. you know they'll it, it's rubber ducking for them mentally as well yes uh, because they'll be like oh well, wait a minute what did you just say oh, that's the problem that's it you yes. know yes. and it, it highlights it so yeah. that's a good thing yeah yeah <laughs> so is is there anything in particular you fancy talking about before we before we head off? Um, there was something that I thought about, but I forgot it. Um, I, I forget more than I remember these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, no, I, I think that's good. Um, you know, we've covered, covered a good bit of stuff. We have so covered, I appreciate you for having me that's, on. This has been that's fun. fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, well, thank you all for watching here on YouTube or listening on the podcast. Uh, make sure you check out Beachcasts. I'll provide all the links in the show notes of all the things that we've mentioned, and we've mentioned a lot of stuff. Adam, yeah. I will see you at uh, Sunshine PHP. Thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Happy coding, everyone. I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. Bye now.